So I'm Ryan. I'm a game designer and one of the co-creative directors over at Sunday Month. Um, I've been making indie games for a long time. I started with like RPG Maker XP, maybe even 2003 back in the day. Uh, transitioned over to Game Maker, then Mono Game, which we made some games in while we were in college. And now mostly I'm a Unity dev. Um, this is ostensibly a paparazzi postmortem. There's a lot of talk about Sunday Month as a whole in here as well, but I did actually work on Pub to some yeah. degree. <laughs> um, and I'm Isabel. Um, I was probably the, the lead developer on Paparazzi. Um, I've been making games for a long time as well, um, especially uh, at Sunday Month, lots of exciting projects, which we'll kind of talk about some of those. So, um, so Paparazzi is, um, can we hit the, the trailer? Yeah, um, I don't know, like the sound work. I, I'm not super worried about the sound. Um, so Paparazzi is a do first person dog photography game. Um, that we made at Sunday month. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, a, it was about um, between one and 12 people worked on it, which um, we'll be talking about. Um, but we launched this year on Steam, Epic, Itch, um, and Xbox Game Pass. Um, and uh, it's our first console game. Um, it's the largest project that we've ever um, released from Sunday month. Um, and it's a very interesting journey, um, to talk about because, yeah, um, a lot, a lot changed at Sunday month during the course of development. Um, so it's, it's an interesting case study for sure. Cool. Cool. All right. So, so this is a talk about how and why Sunday month changed during the creation of Pup, uh, Paparazzi. Um, a couple of disclaimers though. So this talk is not a guide on how to start a game studio. So, or even how to make a video game, frankly. Um, a lot, of, at least in the Vermont community, a lot of, we get a lot of questions about how to start a game studio or how to keep a game studio running or how to make a video game. Um, there are significantly better sources for entrepreneurship and game development than us on the internet. So this is not the type of stuff that we're gonna be talking about in here. Uh, it's also not a technical or a detailed technical postmortem of paparazzi um, or our games in general. Uh, we may bring up some things like technical debt or the technical mistakes that we made all of them um, throughout, but we're not going to be discussing code or architecture or things like that very much at all. Yeah. Um, and then also just uh, we're only two people um, and we have an interesting perspective as owners of the company, but um, a lot of people touch this game and we can't speak for everyone. So I would encourage folks to reach out uh, about uh, or talk to other other Sunday month folks if they have questions or see maybe blind spots in, in our perspective. Yeah, and in that way, it's not a comprehensive look at everything that happened at Sunday month. Like it doesn't oh, yeah. really, it's not like a deep analysis of our internal culture or a complete picture of everything. But what we will be doing is providing like a, a quick look inside of what is actually now like an eight year old studio that was stable, rarely crunched outside of time in college. Um, and that endured growing pains as everyone kind of discovered the type of people that they were and the things that they want to do. Um, I'd also say that many of the ideas here aren't groundbreaking, right? Especially if you've read any books like ever. So but it does show like how a lot of these issues about game development and indie game development can permeate like through you despite your best efforts. Okay, so what is really Sunday month? So we got to start with this because some of the context is important. Um, yeah, like looking back to Sunday month towards 2018 when Pup got started and maybe even further back to 2014-ish when we got founded, I think I can confidently say that we set ourselves up unsustainably. Um, we made our we made a whole bunch of assumptions about how to make video games. We were young, et cetera, et cetera. We were also college students, right? Like I think Sunday Month was started in Izzy and I's second year of college, and Levi, the other co-owner's first year of college. So we were very, very young when we started up this this studio. Um, Ultimately, as a group, we formed in college around the goal of making great games. You know, not all that strange. But um, what was strange and what I only really think about every so often is 
how absolutely massive of like a college game studio we are, like we were and are. Um, we were a college team of three owners and like 12 dedicated collaborators that would eventually become part-time or full-time workers. And there were also like interns, like we were like 12 years old and we had interns. <laughs> um, and you know, like at that time, like 2014, a lot of the studios around were like three or four people max. And so for me, that is super wild. Um, not, and the, the worst part is because we were kind of good at making video games, we were also like super egotistical um, about it. Uh, we had initiative, we had vision, but what we didn't have was any experience or life, like not only just game development experience, but no life experience. And uh, so what do you think happens when you create an incorporated game studio with 12 people or like 10 to 15 people working on multiple games at the same time under one umbrella at college in our second year? Um, well, amazingly, we survived um, for a while, and you know, we made a bunch of games. But it's really important to note that we kind of survived for a couple of really important financial and otherwise reasons. Firstly, we are not like we were full-time students, which is something that you know we might not look at and be like, "This is a pro," but we were full-time students, and Sunday month wouldn't have been possible if it, if we weren't. Many of us had like student loans and whatnot because we were full-time students. But at the end of the day, like all the things that college gives you for quote unquote free are like really important to starting something like a studio specifically for Sunday month. We got free office space, we have mentorship, we got creative and supportive environment of all of our friends, creative pro like creative professionals, a bunch of other really talented people around us. Um, and then there was literally a cafeteria filled with food like on demand. Um, and you can't even pretend how much time is saved when you don't have to cook all of your meals. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in the interest of transparency, like it's important to talk about those financial factors because like it's not like anyone can just whip up a game studio and we were super lucky that we were uh, able to like work on our company and get school credit for it as well. Um, yep. So as Ryan alluded to, um, this was kind of, an unsustainable way of making games um, in some ways, um, but we had a lot of determination um, and we enjoyed the work that we were doing. I mean, we made really, really great games that, I'm, that we're still proud of, of course. Um, and we were determined to push through and make it work. Yeah, at this point we had released like eight or nine full games. Like this is just like several of them. This was like in 2016, roughly. Um, dad quest was getting started but the classic meme about reaping and sowing you know when we were in college we were sowing and we were having a great time um but by this point like by the 2016 point of this like timeline we were starting to graduate college and so we had to start reaping all of the stuff that we were sowing with our like 14 member team um so yeah a lot of us were graduating our student loans would start requiring payment and now things started to get like really serious. Um, the thing is that we thought we were really good at balancing schoolwork with our creative work projects, right? We made like eight full games, several of which were award-winning. We did a successful Kickstarter among other things. And we, now that we needed real money, we decided to like turn to contract work at the same time as we were finishing Dad Quest. We had just had a successful Kickstarter for Dad Quest. We got like 50K in publisher funding on top, like alongside that. Um, and we call this part of our careers like something like the cycle of chaos. Ultimately, we were in a financially stable position because of our turn to contract work. Um, we had funding for a game. We were kind of set up for success in almost every way you could think of for an indie studio but like half of our team were still students and half of the team were not students. And some of us had like massive student loans. I remember for me specifically, I had like 80K to, to like pay back like right out, right out of school. And I was very motivated to do that. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, this ended up becoming this cycle of chaos, which we'll be turning, which we'll be talking about. Um, and ultimately we also learned our limitations, yeah. um, but we also ignored them for quite a while. <laughs> and since we're just running a little, Behind. I'm going to skip through this part to go right into fall of 2018. Yeah. Um, so introducing uh, paparazzi. So the state of Sunday month in 2018, um, which is the start of our story. Um, basically, um, morale was kind of low. Um, we had been 
balancing, like Ryan said, contract work along with um, our internal gains. Um, so that uh, ended up being pretty difficult for reasons I'll get into. Um, and we just really, really wanted to ship something. So we had just been uh, that previous summer working on a game that uh, I was leading called Plant, which was called Plant Game, which is like a gardening uh, game, which is on the previous slide. Um, that project ended up getting canceled, unfortunately. Um, and like we were all just desperate to finish and ship something. Um, so we were like, what game can we make in two weeks? Um, and we came up with uh, multiplayer, head-to-head -head competitive dog spotting. Um, and so you, you're in an arena, it's split screen, and you go around and take pictures of dogs. Um, and the more dogs that you get, the more points you get. And it's like, yeah, each photo is scored. Um, so we planned for two weeks. It took us two months, of course. Obviously. Um, <laughs> obviously. Um, and it was pretty chaotic and uh, difficult, uh, of course, because games are really hard to make. Um, some things, uh, some examples of like the, the chaos of this process, uh, sound implementation was neglected until the last minute. That might sound familiar to people. Apologies to Jack Gates, our composer and sound designer. Um, we had a lot of technical issues, um, UI framework, uh, handling multiplayer gamepad input and uh, optimization are some examples. Um, but uh, we made this game and we thought it was cute and fun. We enjoyed playing it with each other. Um, and we, like I said, really wanted to ship something. So we worked on making marketing art, Steam and Itch store pages and got ready to release it. Um, so we kind of did like two months of, of development on this project and then like another maybe two months of like post development, like QA testing a little bit internally and um, fixing the occasional bug and like preparing these store pages for a release. At the same time, of, as we did all this, because again, we have a huge team and only a big portion, like only a small portion of the team, or maybe not a small portion, but like a halftime portion of like four or five, six people were working on this project. At the same time, we had two other owners because Izzy was running this project that needed stuff to do. And thus, because of the size of our team and just the sheer amount of things that we needed to do, and also both an abundance and yet a lack of contract work at the same time, somehow, we ended up spinning up two other projects maybe even three other projects around this period. Um, and one problem that we had was we never called a project spin-up period, ideation, or pre-production. We just said we were making a new video game. Mm -hmm. And that led to us creating Barista Witch and Autumn's End. And also, you know, technically publishing like another one of our friends and like projects who was working with us, uh, Trust. But we, we don't really talk too much about that here. And along to all, on top of this, we were also doing like two longer term client projects. They weren't really super, super time consuming for some of the team, but they were for others. Um, and these were the things that were actually funding all of us because around early 2019, most of us were out of school or exiting school, needed like full-time payment. Also, we needed to like fulfill ourselves creatively among other things. Um, and while we were like trying to spin up these projects, our two week paparazzi project was technically done so we technically stopped working on it. And, you know, Pup at that time suffered a lot because of that. And then ultimately, we, I guess we just decided that it was like Pup was the best thing that was going for us. <laughs> and we, we'll talk more about why in a little bit. And uh, we yeah. decided to reboot it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like Ryan said, um, basically, we, in that, that two months, like post development, so the like second half of this early phase of the project, like um, people were basically coming on and off the team um, and mostly off. So like there were fewer folks working on it, but we, we made the call that Paparazzi was gonna be an interesting and fun project to work on. We thought, I think that we thought that um, it was marketable concept and something we could actually finish. So we decided to start over from scratch, a uh, new Unity project, um, and redesign it. So the biggest change that we started on first was adding a solo mode. 
um, because remember, Paparazzi was a multiplayer game. And so we were like, you know, this is cool, but if people don't have friends, then there should be a solo mode. Um, so uh, there's a couple of uh, pics of like er this early phase. This was like March or so of 2019. Um, and you can see on the left, this is like a flow chart of the new narrative design. Um, and each of these nodes is uh, another menu, basically, that you go through um, as you're, the idea was like, okay, um, if we take like the social media theme of where you're like taking pictures of dogs and posting them online and you become famous, like how about there are these different like faux internet like ways to engage with the game. And it's sort of like with hindsight ended up looking a little bit like Hypnospace Outlaw. Um, but this was like on paper, right? So this was a narrative design that was pretty complicated and it was all on paper. Um, meanwhile, we were working on like technical systems to build all of this UI. Um, we were working on um, like a first person parkour movement controller. Um, the photo systems um, were pretty, um, had, a, had a lot of requirements. So we had to like store photos, save photos, score photos and recognize what content is in a photo. Um, and of course, like the dog AI, um, all of that needed to happen. And we had two slash three artists, meanwhile, who started at the same time as the rest of the team and needed stuff to do. Um, so they started working on dogs, of course, um, but then we needed environments. So we did some uh, environment design and these two environments on the right that you see screenshotted here um, were made and then completely scrapped very, very early on, um, unfortunately. So progress was was slow is basically what I'm getting at. Um, it seemed like we were pretty close to a game loop, to having a, a functioning core of the game. But at the same time, as the weeks and months went by, we didn't seem to be getting any closer to this goal. Um, oh, there's another slide here too, um, which is, uh, what is wrong with this picture? These are really beautiful um, art scenes. Uh, and huge shout out to Alexi, um, who did these uh, most of this environment art, as well as Campbell, who is our lead artist, um, and Christy, who made the dogs. Um, our three artists. The thing that's wrong with this picture is that these were not playable levels. Well, the one on the left was, but these, these, all of this environment art was happening without a core game loop to, to build off of, which meant that it was happening in a vacuum. And we didn't know how much we were going to have to change as the game changed and came together. Um, so moving on, this is the cycle of chaos. And this is kind of our core thesis um, for this talk, where uh, this is what we think basically was the core problem at the heart of Sunday month. Um, for years, not just on paparazzi, but highlighted by paparazzi. Yeah, because you can't forget that while we were working on Pup, it's not like we canceled yet, like Barista Witch, which was basically a like a oh, cool yeah. farming sim where you made coffee for like little woodland creatures, or um, Autumn's End, which was a point and click adventure game. We were doing that. We were working on those projects passively. We were also doing two pretty large like contracts that were paying enough paying us enough to do all of this like work on all of these projects at the same time and we were doing this pup stuff and somehow to this day i don't really fully understand it we were not crunching and we were working 32 hour weeks mm -hmm. so we were doing all of this in like a ridiculously small amount of time oh just to highlight one thing so between paparazzi autumn Zen, and barista witch that's one creative game project for each of the three owners of Sunday Month. Yeah, so for me, it was Barista Witch, Levi was Autumn's End, and Pup was Izzy. So yeah, we can take a look at the cycle of chaos here. Basically, you got juggling multiple projects and contracts, leading to us having our attention split. Because at, at the end of the day, I was borderline running most of our contract work and Barista Witch. Um, and making sure that we were getting contract work. So I was doing biz dev and B2B business work, which meant that while we were working on all of these things, we had no time to make a strong centralized process, um, which meant that it made us, and 
that made us very ineffective at prototyping. And in order to keep the morale up, I feel like unintentionally, we just said we were starting projects instead of being like, hey, these are projects that might get canceled, i.e. we didn't call these ideation phases for projects. We said, hey, everyone, we're all doing this because we're all really excited to make video games. Let's make a bunch of cool video games because we're kind of suffering making contracts. So let's do this stuff. But at the end of the day, we were setting ourselves up for an unsustainable cycle, which we're in right now, um, because we didn't have any other time to like think about what we were doing. With that said, we did have a lot of meetings where we did think about what we were doing, but we kept making the decision to do it again or like keep the cycle going. And ultimately this led to uncertainty and fear around, can we keep this thing going? Can we actually make games in this way? Um, our production, our production, like our internal game production lacked, what is the word I'm looking for here? It lacked just focus. But at the same, and none of these games, like these internal projects were making us money, but our contracts were extremely stable. Like we constantly got more and more contract work coming in. We were able to easily keep a 50, 60% like load of contracts. But the problem was that none of our games were making money. And something we didn't note right now is that DadQuest had released in 2018, right? That was like our big project before Pup. And it did not- uh, and like while years, that I think. Yeah, like a four years. And that was my previous project. Um, and it took a lot out of us to make that project and do the contracts that funded that and all the other things going on. But it also didn't succeed, which really put a dent in, I guess you could say, our, our confidence. So when that happened, when DadQuest ultimately failed, even though, it boot, like, even though the financial or like the money that we got from DadQuest from our publisher is a, effectively what jump-started Sunday month post-college. When it failed, we started asking ourselves like, oh, because everything up to that had gone great. <laughs> like at least from like a creative award-winning perspective. But when DadQuest failed, we were asking ourselves like, oh, so are we gonna be doing contract works forever? And it kind of put a lot of pressure on us to try and find and and create the perfect next game, which led to us creating Barista Witch and Plant Game and Autumn's End. We were really struggling to find like, okay, dad quest didn't work. What is wrong with us? What is wrong with our process? What's wrong with our creative direction? And that put us in a position where contract works, which were easy and we were good at, and also award-winning at, were making us money and our internal projects were simply not. But yeah. we had started Sunday month to create Inter like create projects like this. So this is like the surprising sustainability of contract work development, plus the inherent Sunday month desire to make creative or in like indie projects without the constraints of contract work, which we were doing as a means to an end, led to this vicious cycle of development hell where we started and canceled projects over and over again, yeah. which we kind of exemplify as our musical chairs problem or this cycle of chaos. Yeah, musical chairs referring to um people having to come on and off the team as we juggled different projects, like three games, two large contracts, and a, uh, bunch of a handful small of smaller projects and contracts. Um, and yeah, it, it leads to missing deadlines. Um, internal deadlines. We almost never internal deadlines, not external. We always, um, for the most part, hit our external deadlines for, for clients um, because we were prioritizing those at some point um but uh either canceling games or doing these huge overhauls where we're like okay this this project isn't working let's let's reimagine it um and throw out a lot of work um and so the human cost of all of this was really huge um as leaders of a company you kind of have responsibility over the culture um at your company and especially this uncertainty and fear um, had a really strong impact on kind of every aspect of Sunday Month's culture. So um, everyone could tell, there's a point at, during this process where the team kind of looks at what's happening and looks at the plan and is like, this doesn't match up. This doesn't feel realistic. It's not going to work. Um, and so, there was kind of this thing of perpetual burnout. Um, we tried to stay positive. We liked the work that we were doing. We, we liked the games. Um, 
even dab quest like that's an amazing game and like i'm still so proud of it um yeah but like in faced with the reality of this cycle of chaos um everyone kind of like uh uh is hurting and it erodes communication basically it makes it hard to want to take responsibility for any part of a game because you don't know if it's going to work out you you're pretty sure that you're not going to hit this deadline that izzy thinks you're going to hit um <laughs> and um so it, it becomes hard to invest in your creative work when you don't know if that's going to live to see the light of day if it's going to make it to ship or if it's going to be totally scrapped when we decide that the project needs to go in a different direction yeah and the worst part about this whole thing is emotionally i think a lot of us felt like we were locked in because while the model wasn't really working for our like studio creative goals it was financially stable like we kept getting like we kept getting money we kept paying people and we had an office we were moving into a bigger office we moved into a we were about to move into an even bigger office right before the pandemic happened but ultimately around this point we had started asking ourselves some pretty hard questions like this site like we identified the cycle as a community we were like okay like this cycle is affecting every single part of our company culture like including our ability to create to collaborate creatively right there was resentment being created like people didn't even really know why they were still making games when they could just go make more money doing the exact same kind of contract work that they were doing before um, because, you know, instead of doing 100% contract work and paying everyone for that, like the people who are doing the most contract work on the studio usually are engineering work, where kind of funding all of the other extraneous things that you need to do to run a studio, like in this case, B2B, but also like QA, like getting QA testers involved, like paying like audio people, paying our artists who, you know, then spent their time making a bunch of levels for PUP that ended up either getting scrapped or just like had no gameplay loop attached to them. And you know, the biggest problem here beyond the obvious effects that it had on our team is that leadership were, had creative needs that couldn't be met. So like Levi and I, for example, and I don't speak for Levi as we said earlier, but Levi and I had creative needs that we could, couldn't be met and we didn't know at this point. We were starting to feel it and this manifested with the cancellations of Barista Witch and Autumn's End and then ultimately the team, as we identified this cycle, decided that Pup, like Paparazzi, was going to be the game that we felt comfortable dedicating all of our resources to. And that we all dedicated, like the contract work money was going to go into Pup, the development cycle money, like the resources that we canceled the projects from would go on to Pup. We tried to focus as much as we could on Pup and our contracts. And this led to Levi and I asking a big question, which was, what is a Sunday month game? But what it really meant was we're not actually we're not feeling creatively fulfilled by any of the Sunday month games that are being made right now. And now Paparazzi, a game that neither of us were leads on or creative directors on, was going to be the game that we were putting like everything into. We we like navigated this by saying that narratively we just wanted to push the game like further, add deeper meaning or like subversion to the game, like we did with a lot of our own personal projects, like the subversion of Dad Quest, which I won't bring up or like the subversion of various, like the narrative idiosyncrasies from all of our previous games. Like we were bringing that up as saying like, hey, what makes a Sunday month game? But really what it meant is we didn't know what a Sunday month game was and we wanted something that we didn't have anymore. Um, and this led to a conflict within our team that prevented creative buy-in from Levi or I at the start of any project, which ultimately led to these cancellations here of Barista Witch and Autumn's End. Yeah. And then due to the cancellations, everyone at this point needed to like evaluate our situation. Yeah. So Levi, Ryan, and I basically had a couple of long and pretty tough meetings where basically we were at a point where there was nothing else to do but to like really untangle our relationships and, and our like a, address the resentment that builds up when you're in the cycle of chaos. Um, and Fortunately, we were able to be honest with each other and figure out what we needed to do basically in order to make the best out of our situation. Yeah. So we decided to cancel, like phase out contract work 
focus on Pupper, like focus on one game, cancel all of our other projects. At the same time, me personally, like this was around the time there was political upheaval in the country. And I was starting to realize that I lived in an area where there were no, or there were very few black people basically. And when I was looking out into the, ga the greater game industry as a whole, I was like, there aren't really that many game studios with visibly black leads. And I realized that Sunday month, because my role had shifted so deeply into this B2B, like making sure we had contracts, doing our finances, I was like effectively our CFO. I was feeling very invisible, which really didn't feel great because I was one of the co-owners of the company here. And also at the time was running the part of the company that made sure that we were financially stable. So with that in mind, I decided to, with like the blessing of the other two owners, split out the contract work out of Sunday month and into Weathered Sweater. So that Sunday month could focus on projects like paparazzi and so that we could like try and figure out how to end this cycle of chaos. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'll also just add that like we, during all of this process, tried to be as transparent as possible with the team. So pretty much as soon as we figured this out, we started talking to everyone about it. Um, we knew that it would lead to basically layoffs if we had to uh, wind down our income stream and weren't going to be making money from games. So it was kind of a huge risk and we were upfront with everyone about it. We gave people like four or five months of notice about this. We had big company-wide discussion meetings. Um, and I think that it was really important ultimately in order to uh, try to have as much good faith as possible um, yeah. so that, yeah, so that things worked out. Yeah, and previously we didn't have like revenue share with our games. Like it was just, we were paid, like everyone was paid what they were paid. Um, and if there was revenue shared, it was tied to the projects that people actually worked on specifically. So with PUP, we decided to, as we were transitioning, uh, give everyone who worked full time a revenue share directly tied to PUP, even if they weren't working on it. Because at the end of the day, if you were working on contracts, you were working on PUP. Yeah. Because you were funding PUP. Yeah. Um, and so that brings us to um, the last phase of this kind of era of paparazzi's development. Um, so uh, we spent another six months or so um, up until March 2020th, um, 2020, uh, working on paparazzi with the full team. And um, all of the problems of the cycle of chaos did not just go away. Um, they were still very much there and it was still very much a chaotic development. So um, to summarize, basically, uh, we finally got to a first iteration of the game loop, like right at the very end of this development, um, and mostly through brute force rather than like engineering or planning. Um, there were not realistic plans or deadlines, which was very stressful. Um, and of course, in the last few weeks of the project, the pandemic hit, which was just, you know, plenty more. Uh, what you see on this slide are is the game loop actually. Um, so all of these screens at the bottom are the, the menus you have to navigate in order to complete one full loop. So every time that you go into a level, take photos of dogs and then submit missions basically in order to progress, you have to go through all of these screens and most of them have transitions. Um, when we did finally start playtesting at the end of this development, we found out very quickly that it was too slow and confusing for players. Um, so uh, throughout this, um, it became clear that some more development was going to have to happen. And uh, I would continue development afterward, after we offboarded uh, most of the team. So um, yeah. Yeah, and during this, this period, yeah, I think, I think a big chunk of our team was, yeah, like still full-time as listed here. Um, and then we transitioned a lot of the people from who weren't working on PUP over to Weathered Sweater to continue taking, like we literally took over contracts from Sunday month that were still in progress and needed to be finished so that we could make this change. Mm -hmm. But yeah. all in all, it wasn't enough. Like we didn't, the, like the focus that we got from that wasn't enough. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so it was, in, it was in rough shape at that time, but I think um, what was there was a lot of potential. The project had really started to come together. The dogs were so cute. 
players loved to pet them and play with them. Um, and it, it was clear that there was a functional game in here somewhere. Um, so um, we offboarded the most of the team and basically another 50% of development timeline happened, which unfortunately we don't have time to go into a lot of detail. There's a lot here to be said about like the design iteration. Um, a couple of things I'll shout out is just that like, because there was less happening uh, in terms of the team, um, I had time to really look at the core UX problems and do big fixes on these deep issues. Um, it did mean redoing work um, and it was still uh, to a lesser extent affected by the, the chaos of the project in general. Um, but I would say it was a lot more successful in the long term and it more also efficient. Also, fewer people. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the chaos was more contained, and like it was slower because there was only like one to three or four people working on it. Because we did bring people back on one at a time, um, but uh, it was more efficient in terms of like actually improving the quality of the game versus the amount of hours that were going into it. Um, Oh, we can't forget and, that Kit Fox also was part of the process yeah. at this point too. Yeah, we uh, we joined up with Kit Fox, and um, I can't overstate how helpful like their mentorship and guidance, as well as UI design help, um, and uh, uh, their contributions were amazingly helpful. So um, we still redid work. We re-implemented the UI like ten more times, like three more times, but like completely. Um, Fisher, yeah. uh, our designer and writer, like we wrote all of the missions twice. Um, and uh, it took a long time to escape what I call secret pre production, which is like we didn't realize that we were in pre production up yeah, until sorry. like 2021. Um, but finally, it started to solidify, leading yeah. to launch. Um, it's a really good game. Um, it's cool. I hope that players enjoy it. I think that they do. All of the photos on the slide are uh, pictures that our, our players took and posted on social media. And it's only a tiny fraction. There's like so many more. Yeah, um, and it's our highest. Or, like all of our games are pretty well reviewed. And after all of this, I think Pup, maybe because of the intentional steps we took throughout to kind of respect it as a game and like respect the vision instead of like, mushing everything we wanted out of the studio into like all of these different projects. It also ended up, and currently, you know, it hasn't been out for super long yet, is our like highest reviewed game. So like it's sitting at like a 96% mm -hmm. with like six negative reviews or something. Yeah. I mean, we also um, don't hate each other, which I think- don't we don't hate go each ahead other. I would even go well. so far as to say that we're mostly all still friends and yeah. we like each other, um, which is great. Um, which is true, yeah. And like, like it's easy to joke about, but like it was, it was a very high stress situation at, at certain points in Sunday. Yeah. Morning. So I'm really grateful for everyone um, coming together and, and sort of figuring it out with us and being. I would say that us. there was a high level of maturity that we had to have as a team. That if we didn't have, and maybe because if we hadn't been doing this all together the entire time, like this could, like I feel like this would have and probably should have gone much worse. But luckily throughout the process, we focused like at Sunday month in general, despite all of our flaws, we focused on transparency, like communicating with the team every, like from the beginning before PUP was even a thing, just communicating yeah. with the team what we were doing. We tried to communicate what we were doing and why, but because we were really inexperienced, a lot of those were just wrong. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that transparency really mattered to making sure that we didn't end up at the end of this, like brutal, like literally not wanting to look at each other. Yeah, again. it's important. And we knew that, fortunately. Um, so there's a couple other points on the slide that you can see. Um, but we got to get to our takeaways. Yeah, so it was exactly. financially successful because of our Game Pass deal. If it wasn't for that, we would have made this game and made like $1, but we didn't. So we can't tell you exactly what it is, but we did make a profit. Yeah. So These we got are characters cool from Barista Witch and Autumn's End. Um, also, shout out to Trust. That game is really cool. You can find it on our itch page. Absolutely. All right, so some of our takeaways here. So my main takeaway, because I was doing a lot of the B2B stuff and I know we're running out of time, is juggling multiple games and contract work is challenging and risky. You know, 
if you ask any angel investor or any person who runs an incubator, they would just tell you this like literally immediately. But it's really important to understand your studio's priorities at the beginning and make sure that that flows from top down or through everyone who works for you if you have a flat structure uh, or risk burning out, even if you have a sustainable quote unquote financial model. Um, and building anything, we wrote here sustainable game production process, but like building almost anything requires uninterrupted focus. And one of the things of our musical chairs team problem created is like literally the least focused or the most interrupted focus that you could possibly have making anything. The fact yeah. that we made good games here is a testament to the quality of our team, not yeah. our production process. Yes, yeah. Do you um, want to say anything about musical chairs team? Uh, just that like, yeah, it's really hard to like do, to, to build a, a, the process when like the needs of other projects at your company are constantly fighting for attention. Absolutely. Um, so similarly, know your production process, have one, try and find, make time to catch your breath and like figure out a way to all be on the same page about what stage of production you're at. Cause like I said, we were at, we were in secret pre-production for a long time and didn't know it. We thought the game was way further along than it actually was. So I, I put down some red flags here. Like if you're missing deadlines, if you're doing huge redesigns, if you're throwing out work late in the project when it feels like you should be further along, you might be in secret pre-production. Um, take a step back, figure out what options you have in order to, um, to remove pressure from the project, which there's more on the next takeaway, um, and uh, like learn what, what concrete things your project needs in order to be ready for full production. So that might be finishing your UX design, your core game loop, finishing your technical systems. Uh, it might be finishing your development tools, but like make that checklist and then do it. And until those things aren't done, you're still in the hot magma ball of anything could change. Um, and that's a, a good place to be at the start of a project, but a dangerous place to be very late. Yeah. And yeah, build a culture of balanced confidence. The cycle of chaos magnifies every small stress and erodes collaboration. And the only reason we survived this, I would argue, is because we were all really, really good friends. We all went to college together. So we had like our own, like we sorted out a lot of these types of problems early on in our careers, like through college, like projects and stuff. And I think if something like this happened in like a real, like brand new studio environment where you just hired a bunch of people, like you would ruin relationships with tons of people. And it's really important to not do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so understand how small stresses get magnified. And so to counter that, I mean, the biggest thing is you have to actually take time to solve the root problems. But in addition to that, like take responsibility for the culture at your company take time to celebrate the stuff that people are doing well this is a really big one I we feel didn't like have time we, to do that we didn't have time we were we we were uh caught up in the cycle and constantly panicking basically and trying to figure out what was the, the solution yeah. and so we forgot to just be like yo this work is amazing you guys are so talented like look at how cool this is this is going to be great people are going to love it yeah, we folk, this cycle also magnified our failures because every time we made a failure or a mistake, the cycle needed to continue. And like we needed to move on to the next project and there just was not as much downtime between projects, especially because of the musical chairs where people were just cycling on and off projects as soon as possible to stay yeah. financially viable. And again, we were doing this all within the context of this 32, 35 hour week. We've rarely, rarely crunched. Yeah. And I don't even, I can't remember a time where we genuinely crunched in the last like four years but there were definitely times where emotionally we were crunching when we weren't actually crunching timeline wise and it's really important to keep an eye out on that kind of pressure point yeah i think that's um, it and that's it um thanks i have a couple of other um i just want to say thank you to like everyone at sunday month everyone who tested the game our online communities on the Sunday month and Kitbox Discords, especially the Sunday month folks who were like with us at the beginning and like um, everyone who helps with the game design. Um, Marguerite helped us with the UI like in huge ways. And yeah, there's a lot of people that, that helps this game happen. 
Yeah. So I think, I think we have, have some time for questions. Wow, we actually finished on time. Yeah, we did. Our... Yeah, we have about we have until three fifty five for some questions. Um, so if anybody wants to open the little like question and Q and A box, you can submit them in there. Um, but I'll. Oh, we immediately have a question from Mila that says, uh, what is the future for Sunday month? Any new honestly, game coming? Honestly, we don't know the answer right now. We are kind of waiting to see how Pup does like more long tail. Because again, we want to celebrate and decide, make intentional decisions instead of jumping right into the next thing so the cycle doesn't continue. Um, right now, the only things that we're considering are like not necessarily sequels, but like updates to current games. Yeah. Um, Sunday month is still around. Um, we, the company isn't going anywhere. I will say, I think it's unlikely that we're going to do another like large team in-house game production as Sunday month. Um, we all have other kind of things going on. Um, and, but that said, we still have hopes, I think, for the projects that we worked on at Sunday month that might still have life in them. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad y'all like Paris Twitch. Uh, the answer is yes, probably at some point. Whether or not it's a Sunday month game, though, is like uh, a completely Paris -Witch. yeah, Paris Twitch. Whether it's a Sunday month game, though, is still in question. We also have a question in the box. <laughs> oh, the Which QA is, box. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> what was Sunday month's process for debriefing and decompressing after Paparazzi's release? A good question is, um, are, you, are you decompressing? Well, okay. Um, after Paparazzi's release, um, we had a, a tiny um, online uh, launch party. Uh, we are in the process, which might be stalled, but will be unstalled, uh, of planning an in-person one, um, since it seems like it'll be safe. Um, maybe maybe this is something that we could improve at. Like, I don't, I don't know that we really have done a lot of um, team-wide uh, decompressing together. I will say working on this post-mortem, I've been meeting with a lot of members of the team one-on-one -on -one, um, yeah. and talking to people. And it's great to be able to reflect um, and to untangle what was going on and talk about it. Um, that has been a huge thing. Um, I would we also argue... did that back during uh, okay. 2020, uh, after we offboarded the full-time team, we, we had a post-mortem. Um, which served the same purpose where we talked about the chaos on the project. And um, so, yeah, having having points for reflecting is really important. Yeah, I would also argue that, again, we, we don't talk about it a lot here, but a lot of pup dev, like 50% of it or more, happened during the COVID pandemic. And uh, it made it quite difficult for us to, like, meet. Like, we closed down our office. We used to work in an office, like, every day. Like, we were completely remote. We were getting used to that. Um, and it is still quite difficult, but again, like we, one of the takeaways, which we made during the creation of this presentation is that we do need to just celebrate more and take time to do things instead of like immediately finishing pup and like jumping into our next business ventures. Like we do wanna, the whole reason I, okay. So the whole reason I decided to even have a, like do a keynote speech was to give us some time to like really talk about pup like together. Cause for the most part, Izzy and I are like busy. Like Izzy was releasing Pup, like I was paying everyone and making sure everything was happening, like on the back end. And we don't, we didn't have a whole lot of time to speak with each other about how things are going. We only got paid, like finally, like our first payment came in like two days ago. So like now is the time that we start decompressing. Now that all of that stuff comes through. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um. I have a question, um, which is, what does this new strong centralized process look like for you? And how do you break free of an unsustainable habit into that behavior or that cycle? So we can't do that at Sunday month. There's too much baggage that we have that we need to take a step away from the company, which is a big reason why we don't have any plans to do anything immediately, but we're not like locking off the possibility is all of us, like all of the owners of the studio have created other studios where we're trying to address these in ways that work for our own creative 
processes and the things that we want. Because one of the things that we failed to do was make sure that the owners had a shared core vision. So one of the main parts of the process is making sure that we understand what we want before we actually create a new thing. Yeah, and making sure that everyone who is a key stakeholder like is creatively like really in tune with what was what's going on. Um, I would say that the as for like what is this process like it's going to be different for everyone um, for every studio, you know, based on team size and culture. But like the I would say the important things from my perspective are like knowing what phase your project is in. Um, having clear expectations for like what you're working on um, and and like making sure that there's like visible, the progress is visible and that you're noting it and celebrating it. Um, and yeah, basically just having that process that everyone can refer back to and know where we are uh, in the big picture. Um, Cause that's I think what this project lacked at points. Um, yeah, and there was a second part to your question that I'm forgetting. Yes, me too. Um, the second part was how do you break free of the unsustainable cycle into the more sustainable? Right, yeah. I mean, we did it by like doing a huge change at our company and totally changing our business model and like losing a bunch, not losing money, but being adjusting for a lower like income. Um, it was it was huge and risky and um, the only way to do it I think is to look for your options to take a step back make time to breathe be like okay we can't just keep throwing people at random tasks in order to have something to do we have to figure out what actually the projects and the company needs in indie development it's really interesting because agile and the way that we were working, we were really trying to be agile and like changing things and canceling projects as soon as we could, as soon as we no noticed they weren't working. And for us, that was not sustainable because we weren't communicating the phases of projects well. We were not communicating well about, I brought it up earlier, are we in ideation? Are we in pre-production? So I'd say the most sustainable thing you can do for this type of studio, like a studio that's making internal or creative games or even just games in general, is to be really intentional when you leave a step. Make sure that everyone on the team agrees that it's time to leave the step so that everyone can be on the same page in the new step. Because once you leave pre-production, you really shouldn't be making dramatic changes. Yeah. And if, you know, if someone on the team who's high up, like let's say if Izzy wanted to be in production, but I was like, you're still in pre-production, we could completely ruin the whole process unintentionally oh, yeah. or even intentionally. Also, um, on one of the takeaway slides, it's like, what, what do you actually need in order to not be in pre-production? Because you can't just be like, okay, we're in production now. Um, there are things that the project like actually requires in order for it to be feasible to do a larger scale production. So like, if you haven't figured out if your game really needs is. a UX design or a game loop, which Paparazzi did, then you can say that you're in production, but you're not. Like, you need to have... Uh, Criteria. Like each, each project is going to be different, but your project needs something in order to not be um, a huge question mark. Um, and, and that's what you really need to be answering in pre-production. Yeah, and there's a lot of really good books about that. And there's a lot of good talks about that that I've only recently started watching and reading and internalizing, like Method, I think by, was it Mark, Mark Cerny or something? I don't even remember their name. And then there's like a book that I've linked to all of my friends, which I can link here as well, which I think is really I good. don't know how to read, unfortunately. <laughs> So, the playful production process, I think it's called a playful production process, an excellent book. So I'll link that in here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing those resources and thank you for um, giving this talk. This was really insightful. Um, you've given me insight about things like with Rad Mag Fight even. So <laughs> this, like I feel really applies to everyone. Yeah. Oh my Someone... god, and huge thank you to you and to Amila and everyone at Rad yeah. Magpie for putting this together. And everyone yeah, thanks for, for inviting us. Making it possible for us to have the pressure to actually put this together instead of just <laughs> not doing it. <laughs>